is that a pretty yeah. good time? Yeah. Okay. Okay, we're 10 after, so we're gonna go ahead and start. Uh, I think today will be fun, interesting, a little bit different. We don't have to have a fire hose of content stuff today. With me here today are a couple uh, very special guests. Uh, this is Christine of Carrick, who runs the University Sandbox Pilot Program, and she's gonna explain a little bit more about that, but this is a great initiative here at the university. It's new, this is the first time we're running it, is that correct? And then of course on the screen, we have the quite illustrious Evan Wheeler of UNICEF. And I don't for sure know the plan and the scheme of who's gonna introduce what and so on, but I wanna just pass off the mic to Christine. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Um, it's really nice to be here and uh, I, I'm really grateful to, to have a few minutes today in your class uh, to talk about this project. Um, so, as Scott mentioned, my name is Christine of Carrick, and I work in the Office of Experiential Learning and Outreach Support. Um, so many of you probably have not heard of that office or have not come in contact with our office yet. Um, and maybe just a show of hands, how many people have even heard of the term experiential learning? Okay. So we got some work to do. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the experiential learning is basically a fancy academic term for uh, saying learning by doing. So anytime you're, you're doing a, a kind of active learning in your class or outside of your class, um, that can be defined as experiential learning. So that can be a co-op, an internship, you could be doing um, a volunteer position as part of your course, community engaged learning, you could do research with a faculty. Um, and for this particular course, uh, you're going to be doing a type of experiential learning that we call organization partnered project. So it means that we are bringing the external partner to you in your course. So you're going to be doing an assignment, a major assignment for your course, but it's going to be partnered with an outside organization and that work that you do is not only gonna to count towards your final grade, but it's also gonna be going towards something greater than yourself, something greater than this course and the University of Toronto. It's going to be contributing uh, to a, a real world problem, a real wor world challenge. Um, and we're so thrilled to be partnering with UNICEF on this uh, initiative. So before I hand it off to Evan uh, at UNICEF, I just wanted to give you a bit of context about why we're doing this particular project uh, and how it connects to the larger sandbox pilot that Scott mentioned. So um, this sandbox pilot is based off a really successful uh, model that started out in Australia uh, about four years ago at the University of New South Wales. And they had this um, you know, partnership in courses model, uh, primarily in their business school, that the faculty that started it was in um, information security. So a lot of their partners were sort of, you know, Ernst & Young, Microsoft, big banks in Australia, uh, working on sort of business uh, type problems and solutions. And so we connected with Australia and we decided, hey, maybe we should try this at U of T but of course we're U of T, so we're gonna do things a little bit differently. Um, there's about 28,000 students in the Faculty of Arts and Science undergrad alone. That's bigger than most whole universities. So we have so many students that we wanna reach and so many students that we wanna give access to this type of activity and this type of learning. So the sandbox at U of T is not only gonna pair one course with one partner organization, we're gonna pair multiple courses in different academic disciplines with that same partner organization. So when I say you guys are the first ones, I truly mean that. You, you are the first semester, first statistical sciences course that's going to be partnering with UNICEF alongside a course in ethics, in Trinity uh, Ethics Society and Law, they're going to be, uh, they're, they're in their course already and they're going to be examining this exact same problem from an ethical lens. Uh, there's a computer science course that's doing some software engineering for UNICEF that's going to be transforming um, one of their data platforms into a public facing source. 
Uh, there's a psychology course uh, in human uh, behavior and organizational behavior, and they're looking at sort of the human resources angle, how to um, affect cultural change within UNICEF so that their leadership can adopt some of these new technologies. Uh, and there's uh, also a, did I forget it? There's a political science course uh, that's going to be uh, starting in the winter. And they're going to be looking at sort of the geopolitical implications of this type of technology, of conflict prediction and escalation. Um, so you are just part of the bigger picture of the sandbox. Um, and so I'm so thrilled to be introducing this project to you. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Evan, but I just wanted to, to let you know that you'll probably be seeing me uh, at the end of the term when you're presenting your work um, and also um, we're probably going to be distributing some evaluations to you um, not on the course itself but just on this particular project with UNICEF because we want to know how this sandbox pilot is going what we can do differently next year or next term um, so I really appreciate your input on that um, and I think that's everything I have to say I'll hand it off to Evan who can talk uh, more specifically about the project thank you very much Perfect, and Evan, we're gonna like take a little moment to get you set up here, but I wanted to, um, this is my morning class, so these are the dedicated students. I thought I would just flip the screen around so you can see our lovely lecture hall and all the students. And we're gonna be a little bit kind of ghetto with this as I kind of set the mic on the speaker and hopefully this is gonna work okay. So I'm gonna run to the back and make sure everything's sounding good. But I'll leave it to you, Evan. Cool, thanks so much, and uh, great to be here. Um, so yeah, my name is Evan Wheeler, and uh, I work with UNICEF's Digital Center of Excellence um, based here in Nairobi, Kenya. And so it's a, a relatively new office in the organization, about a year and a half old, and, and our mandate is really to help um, to accelerate the digital transformation of, of UNICEF's work for children around the world. Um, so I hope everyone is familiar with UNICEF. Um, we're a, an international organization, so a, a UN fund for the, the UN, United Nations Fund for Children um, that kind of came about um, after World War II and um, works for children's rights and needs um, in over 190 countries and territories. We've got over 20,000 personnel, and we are the largest um, purchaser of vaccines in the world and largest single purchaser of number two pencils. Um, so we, um, you know, work in, in every area affecting a child's life. So everything it takes for them to um, survive and thrive and learn um, and everything from, of course, vaccination, but, uh, early childhood education, um, um, uh, education, a lot of work in supply and logistics. Um, we purchase and move around a lot of uh, supplies. And we also do quite a lot of emergency response activities. So uh, a lot of times organizations tend to split or, or specialize either in the kind of international development that is kind of poverty reduction um, and institution building and system strengthening or in the humanitarian space of kind of responding to immediate needs um, of those affected by crises. UNICEF is a rare organization that does both, um, which means we can be very effective um, in our humanitarian work because we have uh, presence and, and staff um, in a lot of places and we're familiar with countries in a way that a lot of organizations that kind of just come in to respond to an emergency um, don't have those, um, you know, the local knowledge and the, and the relationships to, to be affected. Um, and emergencies, unfortunately, are bigger and bigger part of UNICEF's work. Um, in 2022, uh, there were, at the beginning of the year, 274 million people in need of 
some sort of humanitarian assistance and protection. Um, the and that's in 145 territories and countries. Um, the number of countries experiencing violent conflict is at a 30 year high. Um, and kind of out of all of that humanitarian need, conflict drives 80% of, of all of that. Um, so again, in, in 2022, there are approximately 103 million people forcibly displaced from their homes. So um, either because of the threat of violence or the destruction of um, their communities. And um, that's the most since World War II with 37 million of those being children. Um, and it's really disruptive um, for children to be forcibly displaced and it has an outsized impact on their um, their trajectory in life. Um, you know, they often, you know, have to leave their home quickly. Um, they may not have official immigration status um, access to schooling or health care. Um, they're often more likely to be in danger or to uh, be detained, um, deprived of schooling opportunities, um, and, and discriminated against. Um, UNICEF in our humanitarian work um, has a adopted a kind of no regrets policy. So we're um, for the last several years, have been working to be um, more proactive and um, more risk informed in our planning and response to humanitarian crises and really make sure that we are making preparations and taking anticipate, anticipatory action um, when it makes sense to. Um, part of that has been introducing a, a kind of horizon scanning process where um, experts from each of our country offices with colleagues from our regional offices and our emergency operation, our global emergency operations team um, kind of have these regular um, discussions to review um, and identify any imminent threats in a, in a particular place and taking a risk informed approach and, and considering, you know, something that has a small likelihood of happening, but would have a, uh, a very large impact on children. Um, and through that lens, really think about how can we prepare better um, in, you know, face of those, those risks, and what anticipatory action might we be able to take. Uh, so in that kind of first part, the preparation, uh, a key part of that is to um, review um, emergency readiness and preparation plans. Um, so each of our um, offices maintains kind of readiness plans um, to deal with certain um, uh, more likely uh, risks. So if it's a, you know, coastal area that experiences um, extreme weather events like typhoons, there's probably a section in their readiness plans on that. Um, there might be sections to deal with uh, on, on how, you know, what our first steps would be um, if there were the outbreak of a violent conflict event. And, and then in some cases, defining anticipatory actions if we kind of some of these risks seem more imminent. And those anticipatory actions might be um, pre-ordering supplies, pre-positioning supplies. Um, in some cases, it, it might be even a little um, um, looking even further ahead. In some cases, we might begin making advanced market commitments. Um, so if we see that um, there in several places might be um, higher risks of extreme weather events like floods um, that might make us think that um, certain communicable diseases might then uh, be 
affect more people. And if there aren't enough suppliers in the marketplace um, producing a certain drug or supply, uh, we engage in market shaping to help create more suppliers or to help uh, expand the capacity of suppliers to produce essential medicines or um, consumable commodities that would be needed to to deal with certain types of um, humanitarian events. Um, but back to conflict. As I said, 80% of humanitarian needs are driven by conflict. Um, some directly, you know, the, the immediate effects of violence um, and also indirectly. Um, you know, availability of foods in marketplaces can change quite a lot um, when there's war, obviously. Um, and so being better able to um, forecast and anticipate conflict um, can really help UNICEF be more prepared, um, be able to take anticipatory action and, and if, ultimately be better able to to respond um, to children in need. Um, so um, a few years ago, we started looking into the state of the art of um, conflict forecasting. And um, what we found is there's a lot of great work um, that's happened for quite a long time. Um, a lot of statistical models, um, used to predict conflict. Um, but what we noticed is a lot of the work, um, the academic work, uh, often focuses on kind of a, a, a single country model or a single region model. And that is problematic for two reasons. One, operationally, um, for an organ organization like UNICEF, the, the just ML ops of um, kind of training, uh, deploying, retraining, um, potentially 100 plus models, uh, that's going to be hard to afford and just hard to do very well. Um, the other kind of problem is the small data problem. And the, you know, it's, it's easy to train a model and get some pretty good predictions in, in terms of conflict forecasting uh, for countries that have a history of violence, of armed conflict that occurs, you know, has, has occurred in the past. Um, but that's not as valuable as making accurate predictions in places that have had a, a much more peaceful uh, history in the modern age. And um, particularly places that have little to no history of armed conflict in, in the modern era, uh, it's very hard for a single country model to be accurate, you know, uh, and by accurate, uh, that's a bit of a loaded term as well, because um, in those countries, a, a model that just predicts no conflict every month is probably going to be pretty accurate. Um, but unfortunately, when it's wrong, um, that's when we really don't want it to be wrong. Um, and so we started doing some work to try to apply some modern, more modern natural language processing and deep learning techniques um, to try to develop a kind of global generalizable model that would be able to learn um, from multiple countries kinds of histories um, when it comes to armed conflict in order to better be able to predict in places that where there's really not a lot of data uh, available that would make a, a single country model effective. Um, so the first step in, in doing that is the data. Um, and we identified two um, 
data sets that we use to train um, to train these models. So one is um, a data source called GDELT, the Global Database of Event, Language, and Tone. And this is a project that's um, been um, scraping global news sources since uh, 1979. Um, and today, uh, GDELT scrapes hundreds and hundreds of sources in dozens of languages around the world and um, makes a data set available every 15 minutes that includes kind of reference, you know, links to these sources and then um, a lot of features that they compute uh, about each news article. Um, because of copyright issues, they can't reproduce kind of the content of the articles, but they can um, and do provide kind of derived features about the events and the places and the actors involved in those events in all of these articles. Um, so they have extensive machine learning pipelines of their own that identify um, nouns in these articles and, um, you know, both in terms of the places, organizations, um, and people that are involved. And then they also um, uh, compute features related to the tone of the article um, to try to get a sense of the severity of the event in terms of its peacefulness or its conflictness um, and a variety of other um, features. And beginning in um, uh, a couple years ago, they started making available uh, document level embeddings of the article text content. So um, embeddings are, are something um, you may have heard of. They're models that allow for um, computing a, a kind of numeric representation of language. And so embeddings are kind of what all these large language models like ChatGTP are, are kind of using behind the scenes to be able to understand similarities um, between different um, um, pieces of written language. And so the kind of, you know, these were kind of started to become in prominence in, in 2013 with the, the publishing of the word to vec um, method, which was a kind of early version of, of, of these embeddings. Um, but what that means is that with the GDEL data, there is a 768 dimension vector, so 768 numbers that represent the content and the meaning of that news article. Um, and with those vectors, we can do um, all kinds of mathematical operations to compare articles, um, to gauge their similarity, to cluster certain topics of articles together, and so on. Um, and with GDEL making those embeddings available, that means we can avoid doing a lot of computations that we might otherwise need to do from um, working with a kind of plain text source. Um, and so that's the data set, the kind of primary data set that, that we've used in our um, model development. Um, now, that's kind of the understanding of what's happening in the world, but in order to predict, we need something to predict. Um, so for that, um, we identified a, another data set, um, ACLED, which is this uh, group, it's the, um, Oh gosh, it is the um, ACLED stands for the Armed Conflict Location Event Data Project. And so ACLED has researchers that in um, monitor sources of over 20 languages and kind of have a process of um, kind of multiple reviewers to create a high quality data set 
um, that at a country level every month um, has a total number of conflict-related events and conflict-related fatalities. And so um, the kind of idea is we try to develop models that using the GDEL global news content um, can those news articles, do they contain a signal that can predict um, escalating conflict in terms of those ACLED number of conflict events and fatalities? Uh, so first we define escalation of conflict and that's something that we found um, is defined very differently in prior work in conflict forecasting. Um, a number of those kind of country specific models that I mentioned um, seek to predict the number of fatalities. Um, so kind of like the actual count of people that die in an armed conflict. Um, but for the goal of a kind of generalizable model, um, that is a little less useful um, because the sad reality is that, you know, um, 10 deaths from uh, uh, related to conflicts in one country um, might be very rare and a cause for alarm. Whereas in another country, um, 10 deaths related to conflict um, sadly might be pretty normal and, uh, and a very common occurrence. Uh, so um, we developed a metric that um, tries to be both consistent across conditions and able to vary as, or, or rather adjust as conditions vary in a particular place and time as well. Mm -hmm. um, so this um, metric is a, a binary um, variable, so either true or false, that we compute in two steps. Um, so first, um, we calculate the trend in violence for a certain month in a certain place by um, taking the slope of an ordinary least squares regression of the number of ACLED's documented fatalities um, in a given month and the preceding two months. Um, and so that let you know gives information about whether that kind of the trend of um, uh, conflict related fatalities is increasing or decreasing at any point in time. Uh, and then so from that slope of over that three month period, we calculate whether that slope is in the 75th percentile of such slopes in that country over the preceding two years. Uh, so with that, we have a metric that is sensitive to small increases uh, in relatively peaceful countries, um, but also kind of smooths out um, small fluctuations in um, places that have more longstanding conflicts or, or um, histories of, of uh, conflicts. Um, so, so now we have some data sources, we have a thing to predict. Um, and so the next we tried to develop a number of different models. Um, and so not only different models, but different, um, approaches to, um, uh, creating and aggregating the training data. Um, so one of the other 
things that I, I didn't mention about the GDEL data is although that GDEL seeks to really include as many sources and, and a wide, a huge diversity of, of new sources, um, the reality is that there are far more um, media sources in um, Western Europe, in the Americas, um, than there are in Sub-Saharan Africa or the Global South widely. Um, and so there's a, a big kind of imbalance in the data set. And so that's why we, we wanted to try a number of different techniques for aggregating kind of all those in data on individual news articles um, to represent kind of what's going on in a given month. Um, so we, one of our models used an approach that um, just uses a, a, uh, a shallow feed forward neural network. Um, and the data are smaller uh, uh, represented countries are oversampled and a technique is applied to those 768 dimension vectors to um, reduce them to a, a smaller number uh, the, of um, smaller dimension of, of numbers that um, and that is used to predict the true or false based on the ACLID labels. Um, second model uh, and second aggregation technique um, uses sampling with replacement to create multiple um, records for each country for each month um, of the same quantity of news article samples. And that model uses um, a transformer architecture. So it kind of treats um, each a summary of each of a sample of news articles from each month as a word in a sentence telling the story um, of the news of that country. And then that model um, again uses that same uh, metric derived from the ACLID uh, conflict data to predict true or false, is the conflict likely to escalate or not? Um, and the third model uh, uses some kind of, I guess, say classic machine learning approaches. So uh, um, it actually is a stacked model of two different models. One is a, a gradient boosting model and one is a k-means clustering model. Um, and that model is uh, conditioned with the country, uh, an indicator of which country it is. Um, and so these were kind of three very promising approaches that ended up having rather similar um, performance characteristics overall. Um, so one measure is this kind of a, a measure of both the false positive rate and true positive rate. And they were all quite similar. Um, but looking at some of their other uh, classification metrics, um, things like precision or recall, um, different models were stronger on different measures and plotting predictions kind of geographically, they appear to be uh, more, there are differences in how they are correct geographically. So some models are more correct in their predictions in some places, whereas another model might be more correct in its predictions in other places. Um, so that's a, 
a challenge for for us in 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 figuring out how can we start incorporating predictions from models into UNICEF's decision-making process around um, preparations. So whether to prioritize kind of reviewing readiness in one place or whether to um, begin taking some sort of anticipatory action, it's hard if we have three models that for a particular place and time don't agree. And since we can observe each model behaving differently, um, our question is, are there, is there some pattern to how one of these models performs that can be helpful for UNICEF to think about how to incorporate uh, into decision making? Is one model better than the others for certain countries or places that speak a certain language? Or is a different model better in places that has higher internet penetration and presumably a bigger digital media market and more higher volume of news written about it? Um, and, you know, while we'd like to be able to use all of these models, um, there's also the practicality of um, cost. Um, some of these models are, you know, require a GPU for doing the predictions um, or a whole lot of RAM, um, where the kind of classic machine learning model uh, can predict, make its predictions using just, uh, you know, a CPU and um, a much smaller kind of infrastructure footprint. Uh, so for our kind of challenge for you this semester is to try to help identify or recognize bias in these models. Um, so um, we've prepared uh, a data set of predictions over uh, a three month span of time from three different models that use these very different um, training set aggregation approaches, very different um, model architectures and then also a data set of, um, I think it's a bit over a thousand different um, country situation indicators. And so these are kind of um, a number of indicators from UNICEF's State of the World's Children Report, which, you know, with in which annually UNICEF documents kind of the um, you know, the situation of children in, in every country and territory. So things like maternal mortality, uh, um, educational attainment at certain ages and things like that. There's also data from um, UNDP's human development indicators, um, World Bank's um, uh, economic indicators, and uh, indicators from the fragile states index, which is a, a kind of measure of stability. Um, and so as you're learning about some of the metrics I mentioned, things like precision and recall and um, unpacking the idea of kind of how do you, what, how do you measure, um, uh, the correctness of, of a model and and also linear relationships, how to, um, as you're learning how um, to build models about 
these relationships, um, applying them to these data to hopefully uncover um, some useful and practical ways that we can take forward these uh, and refine these models for UNSF and, and get them um, more firmly into our regular horizon scanning and decision-making processes. Amazing, Evan, thank you. Uh, so UNICEF is um, pretty inspirational, doing awesome work. Um, the basic kind of summary that I would give of, of everything you told us in the end as it kind of relates to our course is that you have three quite interesting different models, extremely different in architecture, different in the way that they're fit and everything. And we know that there's some bias in these models. And our class, Stat 130, has the opportunity to try to explore these models' predictions, to try to uncover what this bias might be for the purpose of actually supporting your ability, UNICEF's ability, to deploy these in your decision-making processes. I think, I think that's a pretty fair assessment. Does that sound, yeah, okay, wonderful. Um, I wanna pass the mic off to um, Christine again. Would you talk about end of semester projects that the different courses are doing related to this? Sure, thank you. <clears throat> so um, I think you're um, aware of, of your project uh, culmination, which is a poster presentation, um, which you'll be, um, I guess all of your, your um, work will be showcased um, in a poster fair at the Medical Sciences Building on December 7th. Um, and so that's going to be um, a wonderful way for you to demonstrate what you've worked on this term in this major project. Um, and depending on what, you know, data set that you're working with and, and everyone's project will be slightly different, um, but you'll all be presenting on that one same day. Uh, and so I thought that it would be a really great opportunity for um, not just your course, but for all the other courses involved with UNICEF to be presenting their work um, on that same day in that same building. So I'm working on um, a, a showcase uh, on that day, on that morning, um, where the students from the uh, Trinity Ethics Society and Law course will be presenting their work. So they're looking at um, the ethical implications of um, using machine learning to predict conflict. Um, and they're going to be looking at some really interesting angles, uh, maybe comparing to some other, um, you know, similar but not exactly the same situations um, and how maybe that can be harmful rather than helpful, um, what maybe lawmakers or decision makers need to look out for or be aware of when, when using this data to make predictions. Um, and so that'll be a really interesting um, presentation. They're going to be preparing um, presentations and slides that UNICEF will be able to use um, because UNICEF, um, they're sort of just grappling with this new technology themselves just as everyone else is. Um, and so a lot of the um, senior management and senior decision makers within UNICEF um, are, are sort of uh, forming a, a cross-divisional working group to tackle the sort of gray areas of, of AI and machine learning and, and new technology and innovations. Um, and so the ethical, uh, the ethics students, their work will be contributing to that. Um, which is great. Um, we also have, as I mentioned, computer science students that are working with UNICEF. Um, there's four teams uh, of about six or seven students, and they each have a slightly different project where they're, um, they're designing new um, software. I think one of the groups is um, creating an, a web app. Um, they're able to um, use data from other open sources to create these um, sort of real-time maps of the world that other um, organizations or charities or, or anyone else, anyone from the public can use. Um, it's a bit of a challenge because 
um, some of the developing countries maybe don't have any defined borders or those borders change all the time or after conflict. Um, and so this system will be able to map and plot those out. Um, there's also um, some work being done to, as I said, um, take all this data and turn it into something that's public facing. It used to be something just internal to UNICEF, their own uh, data platform, and they're wanting to, to change that into something that can be accessed by anybody. Um, so they're working on really interesting projects there. So they will be presenting their work. Um, and then the psychology students in organizational behavior, um, they're going to be looking at um, primarily questions of bias. Um, and again, sort of what you're looking at, um, but instead of looking at the numbers and the data, they're going to be looking at, well, you know, how can we trust a system that might be biased? How can we make decisions based on something that may lead us astray? Um, and how do we mitigate that? And if we do something based on what a computer or machine model is telling us, and it's wrong, who's liable? Who's accountable for that? Um, they're looking at that. They're also looking at, as I mentioned, culture change within the organization. Um, a lot of this work is very um, revolutionary and happens in a short amount of time. And the innovations in technology are often a lot faster than um, the adaptation of that uh, capability within large organizations, particularly UNICEF that's been around for you know over 70 years. Um, they're very... Um, they have a very defined structure uh, in the way that they work and the way that departments talk to each other and work together and sort of how can, can UNICEF affect change within those um, institutions within itself to adopt these new technologies in order to make these decisions faster, more efficiently. Um, the worst thing that they can think of is having this data and these predictions and then not doing anything in time. Um, and losing out on these opportunities because somebody wasn't trusting what the probabilities were saying. Um, so that's all really interesting stuff. Um, and I really hope that this is an opportunity for you to not only learn from the work that you're doing with UNICEF on your specific project, but also thinking about it in a wider context and thinking about, you know, these problems are not singular to your discipline, to statistics. Um, they are much bigger and they require a lot of other fields of thought. Um, and so this showcase will be a wonderful opportunity for you to see what else goes into these huge complex problems um, that affect the world. Um, and so I, I really hope that you uh, take the opportunity to you know, visit some of the other students in the other courses um, to see what they've been up to and how that relates to the work that you've done. And I'm, I'm certain that most of them will be able to come and see your posters as you present. Um, and so I think it'll be a really great opportunity to share all the learning that you've done this term. Um, and I know that UNICEF and Evan and his colleagues are, are very pleased with the work that the U of T students are doing so far and that they're going to produce at the end. Um, I think it's, it's really amazing that the work that you're doing is going towards something so meaningful and impactful um, that will, you know, potentially carry forward to other, other uh, you know, students or other uh, projects or, or other, um, you know, initiatives for UNICEF um, at, at later dates. Um, I think that's, and maybe you can talk about the... Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to take a quick little break here in a moment, but I have two very important announcements to uh, make related to the course projects. So there is a very interesting opportunity in that this project is very interdisciplinary and very cross-departmental, even, interdepartmental. So these other courses that Christine mentioned are tackling the same problem, but with the tools of their discipline and the perspectives of their discipline. So if you happen to have an opportunity, if it comes up where you can cross-pollinate a little bit and engage and see what's happening other, in the other projects, it's a great way to make an interesting connection and broaden your sense and scope of what we're doing here. We would love for you guys to check out the, uh, I'm sorry, what's the title of this again? The final? The UNICEF Sandbox Showcase. The UNICEF Sandbox Showcase, which will be taking place very close to like where our presentations are. And essentially, it's sort of a joint event. So you have your STAT 130 mentorship uh, program points. 
Um, and if you're on top of these and you've done it, that's wonderful. But attending uh, the UNICEF showcase can count towards your social or your professional pillar. And that happens, of course, on December 7th, which is your last day to do this. So if you're rushing at the end and you need to pick up a couple more points, we have this last kind of great opportunity uh, where you would go uh, explore the showcase, explore the presentations, and then do a reflection kind of the usual way. So it's another place to make sure that we can get those points. We really do want to encourage this kind of cross-pollination because that's a really interesting aspect of what this project is. Now the last thing is these courses are a little bit smaller. Maybe they're on the order of like five projects per course. Is that about right? Okay. All, all a bit different. Only have 20 people, and so and some courses. This is their entire term is just working on this one project for UNICEF, and others it's just sort of like a maybe 25, 35 percent project. So it's all different. It's a lot of variety in what's happening, and we contribute to that in so many ways. We are about going to be 80 teams, so we're really hoping this kind of multi-agent style approach to this can help Evan and his team with so many different groups looking at this problem. However, we're going to select only three projects to be a part of the showcase presentation because we have our own project presentations and we can't put 80 teams to present in here. But we're going to select three that we really like. And the way this is going to work is you need to be nominated by your TA. And of course, we have 24 over all sections of the course. We have 23 different tutorial sections. So it's not even that every tutorial is getting to have one of their teams present. If you're interested in this opportunity to be one of the like very select projects representing STAT 130, uh, you need to be making good progress on your project, and you need to let the TA know your interest so they can kind of be peeking close at what you're doing and have a sense of, I would nominate this team to be one of three that we'll include in the showcase presentations. Um, a great thing about this project is if you're interested in research, this is a research opportunity, a, a truly a research opportunity. And it's the kind of thing that you can leverage into further research opportunities. If you were to be one of the project teams that was selected to be presenting at this showcase, we'll let you know the exact number of teams we have, if it's 80 or 85 or something. But this would be going on your resume. This would be selected out of 500 students, teams, about 85 teams in STAT 130 to give a showcase presentation. So this is a very prestigious opportunity. And I encourage you, if you're trying to build your resume to facilitate research opportunities for yourself, this is a pretty interesting opportunity. OK, so we're going to take a little break here. We're going to call it. Evan, thank you so much. Phenomenal presentation. Really appreciate it. And Christine, thanks for coming in person. OK, so a little break, and we're going to start again at 10 after. So I'm not sure if we have like five or eight minutes or something like that. Perfect timing. Come on in. 
We're giving them a little bit of a break. So we'll start. We'll start in like six minutes. But uh, you found it easily enough. You found the yeah. interesting way in. <laughs> oh, you peeked in. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, good, good. And on off is working well, I think. That's how we're comfortable. And I have my simplified versions of my questions. I think it'll be fine. So they just heard from Evan Wheeler and UNICEF, which is the kind of collaborative partner of the first time we're doing the U of C sandbox pilot, which is part of the experiential learning program at U of C, which is kind of interesting that they're trying to do. So course project, but with some impact on current work with the public sector students. So they have heard all about conflict. So I may need to play my cat. <laughs> but I think I will I'll kick you out there in the light. Is that good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. And it's a pretty good showing actually for the nine o'clock class. Not bad. I didn't know we had lots of good stuff online. I always want to have the earliest class and they, they never give you time. They give you they give you the, the graph it will be starts at ten. Awesome. So I thought this is like the earliest one. Maybe for Brad, but yeah. No, I'm always the earliest in the department. Like, I get in at about 8, so I graduate about to prepare, and there's never anyone around in the morning. And I'm like, how did I get the morning class? I would have loved to teach in the morning. You're a morning person. Because, yeah, and then you have the whole day to, to work. Right? Oh, yeah. Otherwise, you get to do the teaching. Absolutely. And uh, th this semester, I'm all loaded up on Mondays, which I love. So I don't have the rest of the day to work, but then I can. Those open blocks of time, I guess, are so relevant for the kind of work that I'm trying to do. Do you think, uh, I asked earlier when I said that, but do, do you have those tasks, they will be due in many of those days? Many, many, many. They're probably all are curious about the class thing of this. Um, I don't know why, like, ones that go into the CS track or some of them aren't. I don't know exactly what I've tried to do with those students. Like isn't this beautiful? Like this is nice. You're gonna see in the afternoon. Not all lecture halls are really beautiful. <laughs> but here, I I just was really nice. Oh, like uh, is that maybe? Oh, I've been in there. Yeah, yeah, that's real old school. Yeah, it's okay to definitely feel like yeah. I've had a I've had a class in the, I've had a class in the Parma building. I like bake on the back.
Mic check, mic check. Can you guys hear me? Am I mic'd up? I'm mic'd up. Mic check over here. Do you guys hear Piotr? Hello? Okay. Oh, yeah, there we go. Better now? I think good, yeah. All right, we're 10 after. We're going to start up again. Um, I have another visitor for you guys. Hey. Hello, sir. And uh, who are you? Uh, my name is Piotr Zviernik. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Statistics here at UFT. Uh, by the way, if you ever want to find me, just go to the department. You know where the Department of Statistics is? This is the Hydro Building, where Scott is also. 700 go, University. Go to the front desk, ask where is the coffee machine, and I'm most likely going to be there. <laughs> That's where I always find you. <laughs> um, I, have a, I have a little gift. I think Piotr is going to decline it. However... No way. Okay. There we are. Now, these look like beer cans. They're not beer cans, they're something else. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and show you what these are. This is uh, bad. It's a bad follow-on to our discussion about conflict. Piotr, are you interested in some tears of mine enemies? Oh, just, okay. Just, like, just listen. <laughs> okay, I think I'm going to decline. <laughs> you polite. I don't have any enemies, do you? <laughs> uh, enemies, I have minimies. Minimies, I think that's many enemies. I actually don't okay. want minimies, though. I'm trying to make all of these into minimies instead of enemies. And then I won't have minimies. Nonetheless, <laughs> the reason we have a gift, which you have so politely declined, as you do not have enemies, Enjoy it. is the U of T Statistics Graduate Department has recently been, been ranked by the Shanghai rankings number 10 in the world, and by the EDU rankings number five in the world. We are, thank you so much. We are a good grad department, and Piotr, I was wondering, why is that? So I have a couple of explanations, I think. One is the a very strong and growing interdisciplinary profile of the department. Uh, another thing is a very close link to statistical learning, and I think every modern statistical department should have it, and we have it. Um, and I guess the next thing is uh, we have the best undergrads in the world. Mm, I agree. <laughs> there we go. So I was, I was very excited to this. I, I like this kind of ranking stuff. I wanted to bring Piotr in to describe a little bit. Well, I have questions, so you'll see kind of where my questions go. But Piotr, you have an accent. Where are you from? <laughs> um, so I'm originally from Poland. Uh, well, Poland is a, is a relatively big country in Eastern Europe, if you don't know. Uh, it has great food if you like potatoes and cabbage. And uh, well, maybe two things. I wanted to mention three people from Poland that are very widely known, but they are mostly known for being French. Uh, they are both from my hometown, from Warsaw, and that's Marie Curie and Chopin. And there's another person I wanted to mention who is from Poland, but this I already learned very late in my life. Uh, this is a person that in Poland almost nobody knows, but in this room you should know him. It's Jerzy Neyman. Who knows Neyman? I haven't told them. Does anyone you will know? see this name appearing. He's one of the founding fathers of modern statistics. So Neyman is from Poland as well. And you said Madame Curie, is that right? But right, so her, her name, they were, in, in Poland you are forbidden to say Marie Kiri, we say Maria Skłodowska Kiri, her, her name is Skłodowska, she's from Warsaw, so if you want to see, there's a museum, museum uh, with the, in the house where she was born, in the old town in Warsaw, so if you ever visit Poland, go there. And I think I know from our exchanges that 
your undergrad and your grad work, was that all at Warsaw as well? Yes, I, I studied, uh, all my degrees were in, in Poland, in Warsaw. I moved only for my PhD to the UK. Um, back then when I was studying, I was studying in the late 90s. Uh, we, had, we didn't have undergrad and grad. We had five-year programs that would end up with a master's degree. So I got master's in economics and master's in mathematics, both mm -hmm. in Warsaw. Um, so my students have an exam on Friday, midterm exam. And I wanted to ask you, have you ever been stressed for an exam? I, I always get stressed, sometimes very intensely stressed before the exam. I think it's completely normal. Um, do you have any advice? What should the students do to address these concerns about Okay, I, I really don't know. You, you can study in advance. That's de that definitely helps. <laughs> I, I personally uh, think that there is just no way, way around it. In certain subjects, you will be always stressed, and it's important to find your subjects that you are excited about. And in those, make sure that you understand things well, and at least don't be stressed about those. Mm. Um, a, another question for you, Piotr. When did you start imagining that you might want to go to grad school? Um, that was during my studies. I never thought about myself as a researcher. I was a sport journalist back then as a student. And I liked this work because it was very creative. And I like, and I like being creative in my work. I just never thought I could be a creative researcher. And that came to me during studies. Mm. And so after Warsaw and then UK, it, it kind of created a lot of opportunity for you. Eventually, you went to Spain. This is right. Can you tell I, us a little I, about Spain? I went to many countries, but yeah, then we ended up in Spain with my family. Uh, in, we were in Barcelona for six years. It's an amazing city to, to be. Uh, great seafood, great sea, a lot of sun. Uh, people play football in the night. Uh, it's very nice. Uh, but they don't have such a strong stats department as we have here. <laughs> this is why I, I ended up here. Okay, so that was your kind of motivation then for coming to U of T. That was the main motivation for us to move, yes. And we, we scheduled 15 minutes to talk, but it's only seven minutes. So we here have a whole eight minutes because my very last question is, so you're here at U of T, and what are you now up to these days? What's happening in U of T? Okay, so just maybe a, a couple of things that I wanted to mention. Uh, just very briefly about my research. I'm, I'm a mathematical statistician. Uh, interested mostly in the mathematical aspects of statistical problems. I, I mostly look for mathematical beauty in problems, and it's nice when they are statistically motivated. But uh, in our department, we have a, a broad range of people. There are three main themes in the department, and all these themes are independently very strong and, and pulling the department in three different, very exciting directions. And one of these themes is uh, theoretical statistics, theory and methods. Um, and this, the department historically was always uh, strong in this, uh, in this field. Uh, then another uh, theme is applied statistics and computational statistics. We, we've made a lot of great hires recently. So we have a lot of people who are cross-appointed with different departments. Uh, we have a bunch of people doing astrostatistics. We have people doing biostatistics. We have people doing uh, statistics for environmental studies, and so on and so forth. So we, there's a very strong applied component. And uh, finally, there's mathematical, uh, mathematical finance and actuarial sciences. That's also a very strong group with a lot of uh, new and exciting leaks that they build between uh, quantum, quantum uh, physics and finance. Um, so that's this. Uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the department. For some of you, maybe at some point you will start thinking about doing a research project with one of the faculties in, in the department. So I wanted just to give you a piece of advice for that because we get many requests and we cannot really reply to all these requests. And um, because of that, we are looking for certain traits in students. And 
I, per I personally, and this will be different for every faculty, but a, a lot of things will be in common. I personally look for a strong mathematical background, uh, but other people, even more applied, they will still be looking for some of these traits. So they will be uh, hoping to get students who can code, but also understand very well mathematics. So my advice to you is, uh, you're just starting this journey, uh, try to learn your math. That's my own opinion. Not everybody will agree with this. Uh, you will have a lot of exciting applied courses that will build up your profile, but try to focus also on the foundations, which is mathematics. Uh, try to think deeply about what you learn. Don't, don't try to, again, I don't know if you can afford it, but I personally wouldn't focus just on the grades, but on really trying to deeply understand some of the courses that you find exciting. So try to identify something you like and try to excel in it. Try to understand things deeply. Amazing. And we actually have five minutes. So I want to go ahead and discuss the topic I said we wouldn't discuss, which is there is another graduate opportunity in the department, which is MSCAC. That's the Master's of Science in Applied Computing. And it has different concentrations. Uh, and one of them is a joint program with computer science and statistics. And the concentration title is data science. So we just heard from Evan Wheeler at UNICEF. And he was talking about a bunch of different models. He was talking about a transform model, feed forward neural network, machine learning models, uh, XGBoost, and some clustering. He even mentioned MLOps, the actual scalability of deploying models, and so on. So you teach a course that touches on machine learning a little bit. Would you give your thoughts as to how does machine learning fit relative to statistics? What's, and you even mentioned this, that part of the strength of the stats department is our connection like to statistical learning, machine learning, and so on. But how, how do you feel this new discipline, domain of data science and machine learning, what, what's your take, what's your perspective on that these days? So I think the, that people in our department are really trailblazers in this, in this theme. And the theme is trying to, to have a deep vertical understanding of why deep learning works, for example. And we have uh, many PhD students and many faculty who, who focus exactly on that. Um, and I think for that, uh, statistical, statistics and statistical learning has a lot of uh, very well developed tools and, and people try to go uh, and use these tools for that particular problems. The course I'm teaching that Statistics 414, uh, Statistical Methods for Machine Learning 2. In this particular course, we don't teach about deep learning. We try to set up all the foundations. So this is a theoretical course in which we discuss graphical models, graphical models with latent variables. These are all models that led eventually people like Hinton to developing uh, deep learning. And so just one more time, let me confirm. So your work and your pro professional life is concerned with mathematical beauty. Is that right? That's how you said That's it. That's my goal. This is how I get excited about things when they are beautiful and simple. Yeah. But uh, I'm a, a little bit of a singular point, I think, in, the, in our department. But that's fine. <laughs> I wanted to bring Piotr because there's a very interesting opportunity in this course in that we have this course project, which, as you've heard, it truly is research grade. This is ongoing research at a major institution in the world, UNICEF. And you want to explore this project to get a sense of, do I like the way research feels? Do I like this kind of work? And if you do, it's amazing that you're at U of T at such a strong stats department because you can go very far even in your undergrad career. Like I have a reading student right now, Leo, who's gone so far. He's gone further than I went as a grad student because of the amazing availability and course selection that's here at U of T. And if you find yourself pursuing the things that you know you really like and really investing in those, not worrying about the grades, but what you care about, understanding them very deeply, if you find yourself in this type of a situation here at U of T, it's really unique. I don't know how many departments can offer this to undergrads. I will say in the world, maybe 20. I don't know. Maybe it's an underestimate. Um, but you're very, very close to 
the elite of the elite research in statistics and related disciplines like machine learning, statistical learning, data science. And so, of course, you're, you're, it's a, you're, you're early in your career. You don't need to be waking up tomorrow and thinking about grad school. But I want to, you're, you're actually not that far, honestly, because you're starting this course project. This could help catalyze and launch, springboard a research career. And so I wanted to bring, bring Piotr, who's someone I really admire in the department, and I think it's really true. I can tell when I hear the questions he asks in seminar, what he's interested in seminar, I can tell he cares about mathematical beauty. And there really is, uh, I like that too. I'm not as talented Thanks. as you, so I can't get to as beautiful topics, uh, but, I, but I appreciate that. So I wanted you guys to see what does the end of the line look like potentially. Is there any last kind of comments or remarks you no, might want to Maybe there are some questions. Wonderful. Any questions for Piotr? We're putting them on the spot, okay. so I don't know. No. Okay. <laughs> but again, if you want to find Piotr, he's at the coffee machine in the stats department, 700 University. I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> Even okay, now. Okay, great. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks. Now, I'm an optimizer. You've got to take energy and motivation from anywhere you can get it. So if someone challenges you, if someone is pushing you, like maybe me on the midterm, you want to beat me. You want to have a little chip on your shoulder. You want to say, I'm getting pushed, but I don't get pushed around too much. I'm going to push back. I've always found that this sort of sentiment, because it's funny, I find that very, very funny. Here's my enemies. I find that very, very funny. It's not that I really have a lot of enemies and I look for enemies or I view the world as like a bunch of enemies, but it's fun to succeed against odds. You know what I mean? Like against the opposition, like you feel like you might not be able to do it and then you kind of do it. So this is meant to just be a little bit of, uh, I hope, last minute motivation. You've got a week till Friday or maybe a little bit less than a week. You've got good time to study and prepare and keep a chip on your shoulder. Be a little bothered. Like, prove me wrong. Do you know what I mean? Like, show me how well you can do on this exam. So I'm very excited to see that you guys do well. Uh, impress me. This is a great stepping stone. For example, if you were interested in the majors and specialties in the stats department, this course matters an awful lot. You know, if we look at this grade when we're trying to decide admissions and so on. But also it's just more broadly useful. Data science is so ingrained in so many disciplines, not just statistics these days. And you'll hopefully, I think you'll understand, I really believe in the power of coding. I, I really believe it's an important skill that you need to have. That's why my course is so focused on it. And even if you don't take it towards statistics, because I'm more applied than Piotr. To me, I want to build models and I want to run simulations. I want to see how things work. So I'm kind of more coding oriented, but there's just so many applications for it. Uh, if it's in the, it's in just statistics or other domains that can be very applied, opens up the door to data science and so on. So that's kind of what I wanted to use this little transition about as far as the midterm. I think the timing of the midterm is good because hopefully you don't have too many conflicting midterms. So you have more time to study and be ready on this. Now it's true that pushing the midterm later in the semester means you've covered more topics, but think about it. What topics have we covered here? We did confidence intervals, then hypothesis testing, then two sample confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. That's kind of all very, very similar. The techniques are very similar. It's all, all for loops, it's all simulation. There's a lot of variety there, so you've got to distinguish for yourself what's the difference between each of these categories. But I think having more is more here. 
because it reinforces these really critical, important topics. Uh, and even though I keep making it more complicated and keep adding new things, and now it's too sample, but you've had repeated time to see what this process is and try to clarify for yourself what this is. So take the rest of the week uh, to definitely do that and be ready for the midterm. And now what I want to do is preview. That's the midterm exam. It's 16 pages. If you have binocular vision and you can look, you can start to see some of the questions. There they are. There are some of the questions. About half of the points, you can try to take a picture. I think it's going to be too blurry. I see people trying. So you can. About half the points are multiple choice, and they should be ranging from pretty easy, I know this straight away, to I'm looking at code that's a little bit complicated, and I need to figure out what this code is doing. Um, and then the other half of the points are written, handwritten. And most of those, like more than that second half of points, like most of that second half of points, maybe over half of it, is coding. You're coding by hand. Now that's very challenging. I've talked to a lot of students who have taken coding exams like that, like in the computer science department, and they write code, and that's hard. So here's the good news. These are all the reminders and so on of the rules that you're gonna see. Now make sure that you get there at nine o'clock. Don't get there at 9.10 and then get set up and lose time on the exam because we're gonna start right at 9.10. So it's an hour and 50 minutes, but get there, get in your seat early so that you're ready to start and just kind of get yourself as relaxed as one can when they're waiting for an exam to start. You get one normal eight and a half by 11 page. That's this. You can put whatever information you want on it. You can put it on the back side there, you can put it on the front side, you can write it with your beautiful handwriting. If you don't have beautiful handwriting like me, you can write it with your not beautiful handwriting. You can type it out. You can print it. You can use any font you want. I've made this joke already, but I'll make it again. If you're one of those people who just really likes .7 font, you just have always loved small font, then you can probably put an awful lot on a sheet of paper like this. But like, why are you putting this here? This is a study guide. That's what this is. This is to help you review. You should only be writing on here what you understand well. If you don't understand something well and you think you're going to put it on and you think it's going to be very, very helpful and game changing for you, it, it probably won't. On the other hand, you have to write code by hand. It's interesting then that you have a sheet of paper that you could write hints for yourself, templates, code templates that you could refer to. And I said, this is not a course where you just regurgitate whatever I memorized. This is a core I want you to memorize. This is a course where you should understand the concepts very well. So why then would I tell you about half of the points on the exam are you writing code and yet give you a piece of paper where you can write code? It sounds like you're just gonna be regurgitating the information there. No, there's a real, the reason for this is I think this is how coding works these days. For statistics anyway, maybe computer science people feel a little bit different. But when I code, I don't really remember all the details of how to code. I constantly am looking them up. Now I know the concepts very well, hopefully obviously, but I look up the details. And so that's why you can look up the details if you so want to prepare them for yourself on a sheet like this. My university professors always gave me a cheat sheet. I went to a liberal arts college, it was small. Like my class size wasn't like this. It was like 20 students, it was small. But my profs always said, you can have a cheat sheet, definitely. And I bet you're not gonna use it that much. And they were always right. Because the value of a cheat sheet is not having it, it's making it. That's what the value of a cheat sheet is. So you have time to make this until Friday. So put good effort and attention into it. Use it to guide your conceptual understanding of the core concepts. That's how you're gonna do well on this exam. You have the concepts that we've discussed in the class once. Okay, I wanna do something else. Sorry, we're gonna have to, I'm gonna have to click through a bunch of let me ins. Let me ins. 
I sent out this announcement. This announcement says, you guys are lucky. You just go to the exam center, room 100. Everybody goes. So just really easy. Just exam room 100. If you don't know the exam center, it's on McCall Street. It's actually really close to the staff's apartment that Piotr was talking about. We're at 700 University. That's like the corner of university and college and like across Caddy Corner to us is Queens Park. So if you just go back towards campus on college, the first big street you hit past like the Dalavana um, medical stuff is McCall Street and the exam center is on McCall Street. Just look it up if like I'm giving you directions too quickly. Now you have a project group assignment due 9 a.m. on the midterm exam. And some students were like, but why though? And that means they didn't read what I wrote about it in the course project. And that's okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you. This is gonna be on one sample confidence interval and hypothesis test, two sample confidence interval and hypothesis test, and you're gonna learn about a new type of two sample thing called a paired sample, which is actually like a hybrid of a two sample and a one sample. You're going to be practicing your hypothesis test and confidence interval stuff on our course project data. And I'm telling you, this is a great way to make sure that you understand these very well. This is a, your last chance on this project assignment to make sure that you can do these types of questions. Can you do confidence intervals? Can you do hypothesis tests? Don't think, Scott's so terrible, if you wanna think that, that's fine. But don't think, why would he do this to us? Why would he give us an exam and also have an assignment? It's because I'm giving you an opportunity to practice really relevant things for the exam. Like, wink, wink, this is important for the exam. Understanding these things are very important for the exam. With your group. This is a group project. If you don't understand these concepts, ring up your group and be like, we've got to do this project. We've got to do this project assignment. You don't even have to say, I don't know how to do this stuff yet and I have to figure out for the exam. Just be like, we should do this project assignment. And now you can solidify in a group type of study review type of session, make sure you get this. Make sure you can talk about it with your project teams. Make sure that you understand it. And then, what are you doing? You're hanging out with your good friends, I hope and assume in most cases, from your project team. So what do you want to do when you hang out with your best friends from Stat 130? You want to study some more for the exam together. Of course you do. I know you do. That's what I would do if I was with my best friends from Stat 130 and I had a midterm exam coming up. That was worth a lot of points in the class. So there's no, there's like real intentionality to the way I've kind of laid this out. We're delayed in our midterm. That's so we don't conflict with other midterms. So you have a chance to work on this. We have extra material, but we don't. It's all hypothesis testing, confidence interval. It's the core stuff. It's designed to give you multiple passes to understand these concepts. We have an assignment due at the same time, but no, this is to help you get in your groups and study. And then you're in your groups and you can study. So this is set up so that you can do really well. Oh, I've changed, uh, let me find my Zoom again. Or actually, will I be able to find Zoom? This is so you can go to the Rorschach Brewery on the east side. You can say I'm not drinking right now, but hit me up with your tears as my enemy. I just slayed my midterm. <laughs> and then, mm, that's good. And it's very important to stay hydrated too. Okay, we got 20 minutes left. That's the end of my motivation for you. Question here, yes. Yeah. Yes, it's only water. So like they'll have, there we go. So do you see? Sparkling water. It's not real tears of my enemy, and it's not alcohol. Somewhere it should say like non-alcoholic. Because I'm not encouraging drinking alcohol. In fact, I don't drink alcohol. I have a medical condition that causes me to like, well, it, it means alcohol is like very dangerous for me. So I don't. And I don't know, it's like somewhere on there. It would have to say alcohol if it was in there. Okay, real questions now. Yeah, the second question yes. is, Don't need to know them in depth. 
for your course projects. You didn't get that before because I thought you have a lot of templates from the tutorial slides because those are all made in exactly the way that you should make your course projects. But um, down here at the bottom, I note that there's now a template. So go ahead and grab that template. You don't need it for this. For this, you'll just be submitting uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Um, it doesn't have to be slide format. And I imagine you won't want to spend time on formatting since the next one is coming up. It's probably better to use your time on this. But I know from the TAs that basically we are very disappointed by the project slide submissions, which is why I've made the template. And you guys will definitely need to improve. It's okay at this point, honestly, because like I just missed, I, I overestimated what you'd be able to do if I just gave you something. But now with the template, hopefully at this point, and a few more instructions as I learned from this announcement, hopefully you'll be okay. In the back, sir. Yes, no, you. guarantees, like the fact that a 95% confidence interval will work 95% of the time, that's all built on independent samples. So they, oh, I wonder, remember when we were doing the black and white spinning wheel thing, wheel of destiny? In there, there was some discussion about how we would want each spin to be independent. I wouldn't want the fact that I got black, 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 black to mean I couldn't necessarily get black again. Possible they were talking about independence in that context. Well, bootstrapping for the coverage guarantees you'll need independent samples. So I don't know what they said or quite mean, like the subtlety of what they were trying to get at, but no, no, this independence assumption, you need it for bootstrapping. some ways to set the tone. That's where you propose a null hypothesis and then you give evidence against that null hypothesis. So not statistical inference, but the process of the scientific method. So to me, this is the difference between these two things. Yes. Versus unpaired samples, and it's 
to uh, semantic context. That's actually true. So there is now a special case thanks to missing that, where if like if I have two twins, somehow they're genetically not independent, right? So if I had a study with a whole lot of twins, they're naturally paired. This is what will happen on your project assignment when you look at this particular case. The twins are not they're, they're naturally paired. So the statistics or the data that I should use is the difference between the, the twins. I automatically pair them up and I automatically work with the difference because the difference now, now feels independent because two twins, but I have a difference and two other twins and I have their difference. Now the differences are twin by twin as opposed to thinking about two twins that are dependent. And did you have a follow up question? model, 
northern summer, southern hemisphere seems to be part of the bias of the model. So we want to keep a little note on that for the project. So I'd be thinking about the project moving forward. You're trying to understand differences and performance behaviors of these models on the data or on different subsets of the data. That's where the project is trying to get into. And I see your hand up, but there was a question here. Yes, sir.
which I think is a nice way to proceed, but I think later, and I don't know which particular question number it is, but I think later it's actually asking for a two sample comparison. So instead of two individual one sample analyses, you treat those as two different samples, and then you run a, run a two sample analysis on that. I think it's still unclear. Yeah, I'll start with two. Yeah, but it sounds, I, I think maybe you're not quite hearing what I'm remembering is asked. Good question, but the permutation approach lets me only assume that the two populations are the same. So if that's all I'm going to assume, I'm not saying anything about the distribution of forms, so it's non-parametric. Now, what test statistics am I going to compare? I could compare median, I could compare mean, any, I could compare standard deviation, any different statistics I wanted. And the TA, unfortunately, is confusing these with being parametric, but they're not. The idea of a mu is not necessarily parametric. It means the mean of the population, but it doesn't mean I say the population is normal. But it is very common for people to like associate mu with the normal distribution, so I kind of know why the TA did that, but in this case, they don't. Hold on a second. Can you, let's be a little careful. You said bootstrapping in the case of a two-sample test. I wouldn't say that because you aren't bootstrapping in a two-sample test case. Do you maybe mean simulating in a two-sample test? Case? I'm splitting hairs with you, but exactly to like be very, very careful of what is this particular topic, what is my particular topic. I'm going to start packing, but keep talking. So in this case, would you keep the control group constant because you're making a bunch of different bootstrap samples of the treatment group? You can take the difference between that and the constant of average increase of the control group, and that's your distribution. So I would bootstrap. Now here what you should do is you should bootstrap the two samples independently. Yeah. Otherwise, you're not appreciating the variability in the control. You would only be considering the variability in the treatment, and that's not the full story. There is also variability in the control group as well. So you can do both. You're welcome. Hi. Great. Great. I would say it's real easy because if you're doing a for loop and running any 